uh, YouTube for people to um, to view in the future. Uh, and any resource that we share today or any of the slides, we will email them to you uh, for those of you who have been registered. I also want to make you aware that we also uh, run a monthly newsletter uh, for, from the Center for Mental Service Research in which we share resources, mental health and behavioral health resources, of the latest research, webinars, training, workshops. And if you're interested in that, please just let us know. You can email me or email Janet and we can add you to our mailing list. We do that usually at the beginning of each month. And we will be sending out actually one later this week with resources that we have compiled. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, a good colleague and friend, Dr. Daryl Hudson. Uh, he's an associate professor at the Brown School. Uh, he also holds courtesy appointments at the Department of Psychiatry and the Department of Sociology, and he's a faculty scholar uh, with the Institute of Public Health at Washington University. Dr. Hudson completed, he earned his BA in psychology at Morehouse College. He also has a doctoral degree from University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, well, he also received a master's in public health. Uh, Dr. Hudson's career is dedicated to the elimination of racial and ethnic inequities in health. Uh, his great research agenda centers on how social determinants of health, particularly racism, affect multiple health outcomes. Uh, and his work is striving to develop researchers and professionals who are both well-trained and passionate about achieving health equity. Uh, on a personal level, uh, it, it's great to have uh, Daryl with us today. He's a great colleague. And I always learn a lot from his talks and his thoughts on these important topics. Uh, today, he's going to be presenting Black White Differences in Depression, a paradoxical case in social epidemiology. Uh, and we're very excited to have him uh, here. Uh, we, he will be presenting. Uh, if people have questions, please fill out on the, on the chat. And I will moderate the discussion after his, at the end of his talk uh, with the question that you have written in the chat. So with further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Daryl Hudson. Thank you, Ayo, uh, and thank you for everyone for uh, making this possible and for tuning in. Uh, special thanks to, of course, Leo and, and um, Janet and Stacy, um, everyone who, who made this possible. And I hope everyone at home or wherever you may be is safe and, and healthy. Um, and Leo, thank you for giving me a chance to, to put on actual clothes today, put on adult clothes. <laughs> Um, it's been a while, it's been a month or so <laughs> since I put on actual clothes. So, um, and that being said, all joking aside, this is a very serious time and not just our nation's history, but across the globe, um, really unprecedented in terms of modern history. Um, and so I'll be remiss if I didn't discuss um, the pandemic and not just the effect on mental health, but also the effect um, on different racial ethnic minority groups as well. Um, so just kind of addressing the, the elephant in the room, I won't spend too much time talking about the pandemic. Um, obviously this um, is an emergent and, and rapidly evolving situation, but, um, and I, it happened after I received the invitations you present today. But we know that the, the full extent of this pandemic have yet to be seen. And we know with disasters always in, come increases in mental health conditions, including depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse disorders, um, as well as increased incidence of domestic violence and child abuse. So um, thinking about the tremendous loss that some people have had, we've lost um, over 50,000 Americans, um, over 200,000 people worldwide. Um, so people are experiencing a tremendous amount of loss and grief. I think about my hometown of Detroit, Michigan, which um, has been particularly hard hit. And um, while no one in my immediate family or even extended family has been affected directly, um, there's certainly people in the community and a tremendous amount of stress that um, is preservating across the, the region there. Um, and we know that due to the physical distancing measures, which have been effective and quote unquote flattening the curve, um, there's a lot of loneliness um, and people who've lost their jobs and are dealing with all the tremendous upheaval in terms of family conflict, homeschooling, um, et cetera. 
all those things are tremendous stressors and all those things are related to poor mental health outcomes. Um, we also know, unfortunately, that the COVID or coronavirus and its disease, uh, COVID, is not equitably patterned. So we know that the pattern of transmission as well as the severity of cases is not equitable, um, particularly among vulnerable populations. Those include older adults, um, as well as frontline healthcare workers, um, homeless people, undocumented immigrants, as well as incarcerated people who are at particular risk. We also know, unfortunately, that black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted by, um, especially around mortality, around COVID cases. And so therefore we need to improve our surveillance systems, um, trying to track not just cases of uh, behavioral health problems, but also thinking about our other systems that are related, like child abuse and neglect systems. Um, and we have to reinforce our um, mental health service system in general. So that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of the current pandemic and, and just giving some thoughts there. Just a, a, tr a hard transition to, to the previously prepared material. This is the agenda, which I'll be talking about today. Um, so thinking about black, white differences in depression, I'll talk a little bit about fundamental social causes of health inequities in general. Um, I'll talk about what the paradoxical depression findings are and then explain um, what I've done to kind of explain the, the mental health paradox that we see. And then talk about some of the work that I'm doing. Um, I'll focus mostly on the expansion of behavioral health out access and improving quality of care. But I'll also share some work that's been recently funded um, by the Russell Siege Foundation and the, the Gates Foundation. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge all these wonderful people who've been involved in, in not just my mentorship and, and collaborators, but students and um, funders, like I said before, the Russell Sage Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, I think there's also um, a, a tremendous amount of debt of, of gratitude that's owed to anonymous um, participants who oftentimes don't get any sort of credit outside of whatever you're able to incentivize them, but um, the work would not be possible without them. So what is social epidemiology? Um, social epidemiology is a branch of epidemiology that studies the social distribution and social determinants of health. In other words, you're thinking about how states of health, um, how social conditions give rise to patterns of health and disease in individuals and in populations. So in that, there's a great emphasis on social context. So places where people live, work, and play, um, thinking about stress and coping, particularly around issues of or theoretical frameworks thinking about embodiment, so how stress gets under the skin, or weathering, how stress accumulates over the life course and can lead to deleterious health outcomes. Um, there's also a connection, emphasis on the connection between understanding mental and physical health. So as I mentioned before in the outline, thinking about um, some of the social factors that drive health inequities in the United States, especially. Um, and really, racism matters quite a bit. Um, if you think about the policies and practices that have been historic and, and contemporary, um, things like redlining, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, restrictive covenants, lot busting, all these factors that really constrain the resources that are available within social contexts. How those social contexts then in turn create stressors. So the amount of crime and violence or lack of resources that are in neighborhoods. Um, and then also the access to coping resources. So what protective factors might they be, there be? Um, are there, is there access to behavioral health outcomes as well as places to get fresh fruits and vegetables and safely recreate? Um, there's a, a book called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein that explains all those different policies and practices in, in, in a much better and more compelling manner than that I could ever do. Um, there's a video that was produced by that group as well called Segregation by Design. Segregation by Design. It's a 17 minute video. I think it does a tremendous job of distilling some of the major points and why the United States looks the way that it does in regard to segregation, all the different uh, factors related to that. Um, as I mentioned before, redlining is a, is a big deal. So if you look at neighborhoods that were once marked as hazardous, so you couldn't get a loan to develop or 
purchase a home in those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods contemporarily still look essentially the same in terms of disinvestment and lack of resources. And of course, those are some of the places that have the highest amounts of stress and poor outcomes, poor health outcomes. Um, St. Louis is an is a interesting and essentially a, a, a kind of a worst case scenario for segregation in many ways, unfortunately. Um, if you live in, if you've ever been in St. Louis City, if you're not here, or if you live here now, we have some very elaborate um, gates, edifices that have been designed essentially to keep people out. So while they're, they're very attractive and appealing, um, the hidden message there is that people want to keep certain folks out. Um, so in addition to the emphasis on segregation and structuring what social context people live in, there's um, a range of different New Deal era policies that are important to note as well that are mentioned in the color of law again by Richard Rothstein. Um, and many of these things are, are policies that we covered if you've had US history class um, back in 10th grade or so, but you kind of blew past it and people don't recognize how um, influential some of these um, policies have been. For instance, the GI Bill, which allowed for many Americans who served our country to go to a two-year or four-year college or technical school, um, which enabled them to advance their careers and to make more money. Also, the establishment of the Social Security Act. So out of the, out of the kind of crippling nature of the Great Depression, the Social Security Act was established to help people um, as they reached older age to provide older age insurance. Um, other New Deal era policies include the establishment of the homeowners loan corporation, the federal housing authority. Um, all these things made it possible for people to live in the sub suburbs and single homes that were cheaper than renting in urban cores. And you've seen a tremendous disinvestment in, in urban cores ever since the establishment of those things. So what does that mean? It seems that um, there's a direct impact on racial, ethnic health, or not just health, but wealth inequity. So this slide shows that, um, and these are older data. So from 2013, the average white household had just over $650,000 in wealth um, compared to black and Latino families, which were lower than $100,000. And I would probably argue that these data are probably not just out of date, um, but many people, because of the difficulty of how hard it is to collect wealth accurately, many people don't know and many people are in debt. So people who are upperly mobile um, oftentimes take out a tremendous amount of debt um, to finance their education, especially when they don't have families that can provide that, that sort of support. So to pivot to from the social factors, the social inequities that are fueling social context and then stress and coping resources, um, thinking about how depression occurs. So the etiology of depression. Um, so there's two sort of theoretical frameworks that people have come up with. Um, these are not the only ones, but two that I like to compare is the social causation perspective versus the social selection. So if you think about the, the cause of depression, um, if you ascribe to the social causation perspective, you believe that patterns of depression are related to things that happen in the environment. So exposure to stress, trauma, low socioeconomic position, um, a lack of control or hopelessness, as well as negative social evaluation. So being um, judged negatively by peers or being unfairly discriminated against. Um, just to pose that against what some people call the social selection perspective. So this is driven by genetics, uh, family history, uh, perhaps it's biological. So thinking about dysregulated HPA access, um, sometimes there's a connection between physical health problems and mental health conditions, as well as um, changes in brain that are due to substance use. Um, so the causation perspective, social causation perspective, it's really what drives my work in trying to understand how social patterns and conditions, social context, stress and coping could explain um, depression. So thinking about that, that perspective, social causation perspective, when I looked in, so back when I was a doctoral student so many years ago, um, I remember coming across this slide that was prepared by James Jackson at the University of Michigan and 
I was really surprised by these data, which indicate that in essentially every large scale psychiatric epidemiologic study that's been conducted in the United States. So these are all national studies like the epidemiologic catchment area study, the national comorbidity study and national comorbidity study replicated national survey of American life. What we find is that African Americans have lower rates of depression compared to whites. Um, and so I was really puzzled because I would think from a social causation perspective that exposure to more stress and trauma over the life course, as well as having fewer socioeconomic resources, exposure to racial discrimination and et cetera, would be fueling greater rates of depression. So again, when I saw these data, I was really surprised and have essentially been trying to figure out why these data look the way they do for a long time now. I know some of the things that people are thinking of off the top of their head, like it's gotta be measurement, it's gotta be clinician bias, and done some of those invest investigations as well. Um, but I've also got some other sort of nuanced ways of thinking about that. And so I'll share with you my overall agenda. Um, and I'll only share data that I've collected and, um, and present on today on, uh, on a few of these. But essentially I'm looking at four different pathways to understand why African Americans have lower rates, lower rates of depression than whites. Um, one is to look at depression in primary care, so I'll share some of those findings. Uh, most Americans receive their mental health, behavioral health in general, um, in primary care settings. Um, another perspective going beyond the broader health systems perspective is to drill down and talk to people and ask them about their opinions about depression and depression care. Um, so I've done some of that qualitative work. Um, a third perspective um, is something called cost of upward social mobility. Um, and I'll talk about that in greater detail. And finally, another a way of investigating this might be the environmental affordances model, which is a, a conceptual model that was um, pioneered by James Jackson, which essentially is asking if social context um, dictates the, the coping resources in the environment and people cope with things that are unhealthy, but driving down their, their depression rates, but at the expense of their, their mental, their, their physical health. So to delve into um, the primary care piece, so understanding why African Americans have lower rates of depression compared to, to whites, um, we're in a number of different papers um, on this topic. I'll share data from two studies that I've, that I've conducted. One was um, conducted with um, Kaiser Permanente data. So there was a study called the Distance Study, the Diabetes Study of Northern California. Um, in that study, um, we're trying to figure out whether racial ethnic differences in depression recognition among patients who self-report significant depressive symptoms vary um, compared to clinician diagnosed depression or recognized depression. So we had over 20,000 patients in the distance study. Um, these were all Kaiser Permanente members. Um, the beauty of Kaiser, like any other closed healthcare system, is that you have ability to have a closed healthcare system and uh, electronic medical records. So you can see where people are going in terms of referrals. You can see what their diagnoses are. You can see um, the prescriptions that are being written and all that. Um, so again, we wanted to assess the association between uh, patient and provider health system factors um, with out health outcomes among patients with diabetes. And there's a strong connection between um, depression and diabetes. So our outcome variable was clinically recognized depression. Um, this was defined as diagnosis of depression in the medical chart, again, through electronic medical record. Um, referral to mental health services for depression treatment or prescription for antidepressant medication. Um, and overall, um, looking at those clinical clinician recognized depression rates, overall it was really bad across the board in the system. So um, Kaiser prides itself and does a pretty good job. And, and one of their missions is to be the nation's leader in healthcare. But even in that system, we find that there was really poor recognition of depression across the board, regardless of race and ethnicity. And it was particularly bad for African-Americans and Filipinos. So 
just 12% of African Americans and 8% of Filipinos who had significant self-reported symptoms. So using the patient health questionnaire, health questionnaire um, to assess depressive symptoms um, and having a significant threshold, a score that would suggest that they should be followed up by only 12 and 8% respectively of African Americans and Filipinos um, actually received that. So those are only two significant differences from a statistical perspective, but you can see how low these numbers are in general and recognize that it's pretty bad across the board there. In fact, fewer than 15% of patients overall with significant self-reported depressive symptoms were clinically recognized. Um, we did notice, again, lower rates of clinically recognized depression in racial ethnic minorities compared to whites, um, significantly lower rates for Filipino and for, for black patients. So when I moved to St. Louis, I wanted to sort of replicate this study using the Center for Outpatient Health. So at our medical school, we have a, a large primary care clinic um, serving a large patient population here in St. Louis. And so um, we wanted to, in the, med in the waiting room, we had people fill out surveys um, and we also were able to gain consent to match survey data with what was in their medical, their electronic medical record. Uh, all patients were at least 18 years old, a patient at the Center for Outpatient Health and spoke English. Um, so just opposed against the national psych epi data as well as the Kaiser data, we found that 45% of the patients at the Center for Outpatient Health here in St. Louis had a mental health problem, which is obviously really significant. Um, the most common type of mental health condition was depression. So 37% of patients with a uh, mental health condition had depression. Um, and after adjusting for all the pertinent covariates that you can imagine, like gender and education, income, things like that, um, African Americans were actually more likely to have a mental health problem than whites. So again, that um, is just opposed against national data, um, which indicates just the opposite of that. So overall, again, there's poor diagnosis and treatment within Kaiser data, um, even poor among African Americans and Filipinos. Um, and in St. Louis, however, African Americans were more likely to have a mental health condition um, compared to whites. Now there's some caveats to note about the St. Louis population. One is that this patient population had regular access to primary medical care. Um, and also these patients may have been sicker and more likely to be screened for, referred and, and treated for mental health conditions. Um, so moving on beyond that, um, taking a look at qualitative perspectives of depression and depression care, particularly among African American men. Men are often um, underserved, especially in healthcare in general, but especially um, when we think about behavioral health care, um, there's a lot of issues around, say, masculinity, um, in addition to barriers to care, access to care. Um, so we know there's an underutilization of treatment services among African American men. Um, and, but we know little is known about the appropriateness and acceptability of depression care among this group. Um, there's social norms, as I mentioned before, like masculinity and accessibility issues that could form as formidable barriers. Um, so I've written a few papers that have looked at this. Also important to note um, that we collected these data um, in St. Louis in the immediate days before and after the tragic shooting of Michael Brown. Um, so as many of you know who could like conduct research, um, you get these things called history effects. Um, and so we could not have a plan for, for that, just like we can plan for a pandemic. Um, but we had scheduled um, our focus groups around a certain weekend. And just so happened that this, in the middle of our data collection, this tremendous regional event, Ferguson is a suburb of St. Louis, probably um, 15 minutes away from the city core. Um, and so this was a tremendous, as you might imagine, um, impactful event. And it was really difficult to essentially control the focus groups that we led um, after, the, after the 
the shooting of Michael Brown and the subsequent uprisings in Fer Ferguson. In fact, although it wasn't the main prim primary focus of the study, when we asked people about perceptions of discrimination, um, people gave us a lot of information, as you might imagine. Um, they talked about discomfort in going um, around different areas in the region um, and being discriminated against. Um, they also talked about being profiled and harassed by the police, which um, those anecdotal experiences that we collected in the focus group study are also corroborated with the U.S. Department of Justice, um, which found that African Americans were much more likely across the state of Missouri to be um, stopped by the police. Um, but transitioning to perceptions of depression, one quote that really struck me by a participant was that he said, I've been depressed all my life, just down, down, down in the sewer. I'm a Ninja Turtle, if you remember from, if you're like around my age, you remember the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that lived in the sewers. And he was referring to essentially being so down that he felt like he, he lived in the sewers. And so I thought that was a really powerful quote and not often what you think about in terms of men and depression. Um, so acknowledging how, how important depression is. Um, oftentimes people talk about uh, religiosity or spirituality as a protective effect against depression. Um, I think that that is certainly true. I've got other data that I won't present today that, that question that. Um, but one of the things that came out in the focus groups is that people didn't always feel that they can go to church and, um, and feel better. So this participant talks about going to church, you can go to church every day. The preacher is talking about praying. When you leave there, that electric bill or gas bill, they still have to be paid. And someone else chimed in, and you know they're going to pass the basket. Um, so I think that's important to note for practitioners um, as well as researchers. We're thinking about how do you reach African-American men? Oftentimes, if you've done this work before, you know that African-American men are not often in church. Um, oftentimes, they're a small mi minority within churches. I think that's a illustrative quote that, that demonstrates some of the difficulties that men recognize in, in going to church. Um, in, ger in general, perception of depression treatment, um, what I found, which was surprising to me, was that participants didn't indicate they weren't willing to seek out professional assistance in dealing with depression. However, there is a number of barriers that um, were highlighted. Um, one is the cost associated with behavioral health care, as well as insurance coverage, so having adequate insurance coverage. Another was concerns about treatment modalities. So men across the board stated they did not want to be medicated. Um, some men shared they had been medicated before and how difficult, different it made them feel. Um, they also talked about judgment from providers. So they recognized that oftentimes providers were very different from them, whether it was from a race ethnicity perspective social class, et cetera. Um, and they felt that the providers they were seeking treatment from could not, rec could not relate to them, um, which made them reticent to share information. Um, there's also norms of masculinity. So men talked about needing to be perceived as tough in their neighborhoods and how difficult they would find it navigating their neighborhoods and their social networks if people knew that they were seeking um, mental health treatment. All right, so I'll go through that. Oh, another unanticipated finding that I, I pulled out um, from this work was support groups. So one of the heartbreaking things that, that I found at the end of this group was that men asked, well, when's the next one of these? So I'm conducting these one-time focus groups, um, give patient participants there incentives and they're on their way but men were like this was really good we really want to do this again and i wasn't prepared and have the infrastructure to support that so i think that one thing that could be um, adopted for researchers and practitioners is the development of support groups um, which men in this study identify as a viable and socially acceptable um, treatment modality and some men shared experiences with other groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, and they, they found those groups to be helpful, mainly because of the peer-to-peer -peer contact. So it's not just from a provider perspective, which they felt like they couldn't relate to, but they felt that they can relate to their peers. 
Um, so to summarize these findings from the qualitative work, um, these findings indicate there's a need to increase the awareness level of different dep depression treatment options and help to help men to utilize um, mental health coverage. Um, also, because most cases of depression in general are diagnosed and treated in primary care settings, African-American men might be uniquely underserved in that way. Um, men in this study indicated that many of them, most of them I would say, did not have a primary care provider um, and many of them hadn't been to uh, a physician for a checkup in, in a number of years. So I think that's a key kind of hole um, in terms of the services. So the last area that I want to talk about today is um, mental health costs of upward social mobility. Um, so there's this um, book of short stories by James Baldwin, a great American novelist who writes his book of short stories called The Price of the Ticket. The full statement is, is the price of the ticket worth the cost of the admission? Of admission? Um, so is there a mental health cost of upward mobility um, that African Americans are, are paying? Um, and I'll explain what, what I mean by there. But what we notice is that um, despite increases in social economic positions, so greater income, greater education, higher occupational prestige, those things don't always protect the mental or physical health of African Americans. Um, and so I've been wondering, do the benefits conferred, um, can we quantify that? Um, do those benefits translate to improved mental health. And so I've uh, written a number of different papers on that. One thing that is important to note is that African-Americans who have greater upward social mobility more frequently interact um, with whites in integrated settings. Um, because of that, they're actually more likely to be exposed to racial discrimination compared to say working class or poor African-Americans. Um, so we found that in, in another study that African-American men in the highest income and education categories actually had the most exposure to racial discrimination. Um, and we found there's a significant interaction between greater levels of SCP, so again, education and income and racial discrimination, which was related to increased odds of depression among African-American men. So again, um, looking back at these interaction data um, for African-American men who had higher levels of education and higher incomes, those with the greatest amount of those, those resources were actually, again, more likely to have depression um, compared to uh, men who are lower income, lower education, um, especially as racial discrimination exposure increased. Um, so we didn't find any significant interactions between um, social economic resources and discrimination among women. Um, I've got theories about why that might be. Um, and one of the reasons why, one of the theories I wanted to do is to look at intersectionality because women often have, or they do have, um, multiple identities that they're managing. So um, race, ethnicity, gender, body size, sexual orientation, all at the same time. So it's very difficult to disentangle that um, on, a, on a measurement, um, on a study. So I decided to do a follow-up qualitative study, um, conduct a focus group study with college educated African-Americans age 24 or older here in St. Louis. We ended up with 32 people, um, 12 men and 20 women. Um, and we conducted focus groups here in St. Louis lasting about 90 minutes or so. Um, most of the, this was a highly educated um, sample. Most of the people in this sample had graduate um, or professional degree, degrees. Um, some unique factors that we found from the focus groups um, of upwardly mobile African-Americans here in St. Louis is one, there's a tremendous amount of in financial instability. So despite higher levels of income and education, there was still a tremendous amount of instability. If you go back to if you remember from the beginning of the talk, talking about lack of wealth among African-Americans. So wealth is not income, it's not education. Wealth is sticky, it lasts a lot longer, it helps people to transition across life course, helps people to do tough stuff like purchase their first home, have a start a family, to go to school. 
And without that, uh, many African Americans in this particular study reported that they felt a tremendous amount of instability, um, which was exacerbated by their roles within their social networks. So for many um, in this study, they were the first who went to college or the only quote unquote middle class member of their family. So their families turned to them for not just um, financial capital, but also social capital. So trying to figure out how to apply for school, how to get a job, et cetera. Um, There's also the report of discomfort and stress while navigating predominantly white spaces. Um, there's a concept called vigilance um, that one of my colleagues over in the WashU um, Department of Sociology, Hedy Lee, has worked on. Um, and vigilance is essentially when people are concerned about um, and anticipating experiences of, of racial discrimination. So there's the anticipatory stress. Um, people talk about exhaustion from that anticipatory stress. Um, and so I'll, I'll just share a few different quotes from that. Um, as I mentioned before, financial instability was a, a major stressor. Um, people talked about debt and, and overall financial instability. This um, African-American woman um, employed as a social worker, um, age 28, reported that she has a bachelor's in health science, um, but she has $51,000 in debt. Um, and now she's trying to think about pivoting in her career and going to get a degree in nursing while simultaneously the job that she has, which is not really in her field, only pays $11 and 85 cents. Um, and then she's got to pay for the bills and the loans and all that stuff. Um, another, as I mentioned before, discomfort in navigating predominantly white spaces. Um, we came up with a theme called in the spotlight. So for, for African-Americans who are navigating these spaces, oftentimes they um, feel a tremendous amount of pressure um, because they might be the only one. So here a respondent who had a doctoral degree talked about um, being an experience of being in the spotlight. He shares an experience in a social setting. So in the middle of a party, um, one of his classmates starts talking about graduate with assistantship that he got, and she didn't understand how he got it over her. And in the middle of a party that was 20 or 30 people, um, it devolved into this sort of affirmative act action party where people were asking, well, why should we be giving people slots, quote unquote? And um, his competence and capacity was directly questioned. Um, other people talked about, again, being in the spotlight. Um, one quote was, in my firm, I'm the diversity initiative. And especially in the context of this study, uh, being in post-Ferguson, St. Louis, um, most of the, the middle class respondents in the study reported that people relied on them to provide a perspective to make meaning of what was happening in the region. So people wanted to find out what's happening, why are people upset, um, what's going to happen next. Um, and this particular participant talked about feeling this, this crunch between his daily work, um, trying to stay on top of his work email, and then also the, the, the tremendous amount of requests that he received to speak on different issues. As I mentioned before, vigilance was a, a major theme as well. Um, people talked about, participants talked about changing their, their diction and um, the way they spoke, the hairstyles, the way they dressed, as well as even what they, what they ate, all in an effort to mitigate against potential um, unfair treatment. Is also thinking about their, their responsibility to those who look like them were not at the table. And then lastly, um, as I mentioned before, um, the financial instability was exacerbated by uh, feelings of responsibility for other members in the network who were not as financially successful. Um, so this responding, and this was a gendered experience as well. So women talked a lot more than men did in this day about um, providing not just for their immediate family, but also talk, taking care of their extended family. So their mother, in this particular case, the, this respondent is talking about taking care of her mother, a younger sister, um, her father, 
and her, her nephew as well. Um, so her financial stress wasn't just her own, but it was her ability to serve as a, a nexus for other people in the, the network. And lastly, um, important as it relates to uh, depression, people talked about isolation, um, particularly um, men talking about not talking about the discussing the things that actually stress them out. Um, so they talked about this participant mentioned um, that when he's at his saddest moments or when something is really stressing him, um, thinking about calling his family is the last thing that he would do. Um, and rather, he'd rather totally isolate himself in a way um, that insulated him. Um, so I think that's important to note for um, practitioners that sometimes people who are on the surface seem to have it all together might actually be the ones who are struggling the most. Um, as it directly relates to what's happening um, in the pandemic, the Washington Post just on Monday came out with an article talking about um, how COVID is ravaging one of the country's wealthiest black county, arguably the richest black county in the United States is Prince George's County, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. And most of the coronavirus cases, as well as the COVID-19 deaths in the D.C. metro area have been among Prince George's County residents. So um, I've got a, a new set of funding um, which I'll talk about in just a moment, that will investigate um, beyond St. Louis and look at national data to try to understand um, the experience of the process of upward social mobility among African Americans. Um, one thing that I think is really important to, to infuse into that study since it's new and we haven't started data collection is what's happening with, with COVID. So we'll try to do that in some way, shape, or form. So in terms of next steps for me, um, in addition to that work that I just mentioned, um, I think one way to, to extend care is through use of community health workers, which Leo does a, as a leader in the field in terms of um, equipping community health workers who are defined as frontline public health workers who are trusted members of communities. Um, he does a great job of training and supervising and, and setting up the infrastructure for people to become community health workers and to, to work with communities of concern. Um, oftentimes, the best strategies for addressing inequities, especially around social determinants of health, are those that reflect local knowledge. Um, and so because of that, community health workers have been deemed as a, an appropriate and effective um, way to reach hard to reach populations. So thinking about, again, the data from the, the qualitative study with African American men, how they prefer to talk to someone who has similar experiences as them than just a clinician who did not have that, that experience. Um, as I mentioned before, I'll be doing um, some work around cost of upward mobility, especially mental health cost of upward mobility, um, working on some comparative analyses right now using the focus group data that we already have, looking again, uh, comparing our gender experiences, also looking at um, within race social class experiences that relates to um, experiences of, of racism we're doing a multi-city study that was just recently funded by the, the Russell Sage Foundation, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to again tap into what's happening um, with mental health costs of upper mobility broader. Um, as I mentioned before, there could be some, some important implications related to COVID. Um, and then finally, thinking about how um, these mobility costs can also be connected to health behavior. So colleagues of mine, we're actually conducting a webinar right now simultaneously at the same time as us. Um, Rashawn Ray, um, who's a sociologist at the University of Maryland, and um, Keon Gilbert, as well as my friend Melody Goodman, have found that um, African Americans are feel very visible um, when they're seeking physical activity, and that's a deterrent for, for actually seeking out physical activity. So physical activity is a protective, and it is a protective um, health behavior, um, thinking about how people navigate spaces is important, um, whether they feel comfort, comfortable in doing that. Um, lastly, um, if people are interested in more of this type of work, there's a few texts that have come out recently that I think would be good um, if, you, if you want to take a look at. Um, last year, the American Public Health Association Press um, produced racism, science, 
and tools for the public health professional. Um, no, no self-interest there, but I have a chapter in there that talks about racism on health and the effects of racism on health. Um, there's also another book called Men's Health Equity um, that was edited by Derek Griffith, um, who's down at Vanderbilt, and uh, Roman Thorpe, um, who's over at Johns Hopkins. I have a chapter in that one too, but no interest, but that's a really good um, handbook that talks about um, some of the issues that I've discussed. Beyond that, um, there's some wonderful media resources nowadays that you can um, take a look at or listen to in your leisure. Um, last year, the New York Times Magazine, New York Times Magazine had an outstanding podcast called the 1619 Podcast um, that essentially goes back through the 400 years of African Americans here in the United States um, and how um, some of the things, not just social context, but even lack of universal health care are rooted essentially in, in racism. Um, there's another um, podcast that's been picking up steam lately because of coronavirus, which is America Dissected, who's, um, which is run by former Department of um, Public Health Commissioner um, Abdul El Saeed. Um, and then there's other um, related resources as well. Um, there's an outstanding um, podcast called The Serial Podcast that most recently talked about um, experiences within the criminal justice system and how criminal justice you can extrapolate is related to so many different issues that we see in families and communities. And lastly, there's a, a sort of seminal social determinants of health um, video called Unnatural Causes is in Inequality Making Us Sick, um, which is really influential and um, is now widely available um, through YouTube. Um, so that's all the all the slides that I have for you all. I'm looking forward to, to reading what questions that, that you all might have. And thank you all for your time and attention and consideration. Excellent, excellent, Daryl. This is, this is lots to discuss and lots to think about uh, and excellent breadth of sort of the, the work that's been done that you've done and the other work other people have done in this area. So there's been a couple of questions coming in. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll do one on one. Uh, one comes from Hannah, one of our postdocs. Uh, she's, uh, this is asking particularly about your qualitative study findings uh, and expanding on participant thoughts uh, that providers will will not re that providers will not represent their ethnicity or culture. Did any one of, of your participants mention fears? that they will be forced to try treatment modalities that mismatch their needs mm -hmm. or their values. Uh, and whether, and she's also wondering if participants talked also about fears of being discriminated against or even criminalized mm -hmm. uh, by providers who did not come from the same ethnic background uh, components. So any, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I would say to, to a short answer will be yes and yes. Um, there's another book um, that I didn't mention there um, called The Protest Psychosis um, by Jonathan Metzl. Um, Jonathan's down at Vanderbilt. Um, he's written a more recent book that talks about um, essentially whiteness um, as, as it relates to what's happening and, and Dying of Whiteness is the name of that book. But his other book, Protest Psychosis, talks about how especially African-American men are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than depression um, historically. Um, but if you drill down some of the symptoms of um, schizophrenia, like feeling paranoid, feeling like someone's watching you, that matches up with um, feelings of being surveilled um, that many Black men feel. So feeling surveilled by the police or going into a retail store and feeling like people are watching you. Um, so certainly and when it relates to interacting with providers, that, that mistrust and that fear is certainly there. So I think that's a great point. And is another barrier to to care and also directly related to uh, fearing that someone could against their will place them onto some sort of medication or um, I think there's a history of many medical centers um, whether it's a big place like Johns Hopkins or a Wash U um, thinking about um, being enrolled in a study of some sort um, that is against their will and sort of being a, a real life guinea pig uh, reminiscent of the Tuskegee experiment. That, that book is, that, that's, that's a great answer, Daron. That book is really influential. It also mentions uh, the advertisement that uh, drug companies use to advertise 
tranquilizers as well as antipsychotic medications. And many of them were this idea of calming your violent patients. And many of those uh, were depictions of black men. Uh, mm -hmm. So the fear of that this medication can help yeah. uh, that component, which is uh, uh, very troublesome. Uh, we have another question from Angela and say, are there studies showing assimilation as a factor that causes depression, in particular when it creates an identity, uh, an identity crisis for blacks who feel they must confirm uh, to white Af American culture, way of living, thinking to make whites feel comfortable around them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one of my uh, dissertation committee members um, named Karen Lacey wrote a, a book called uh, Blue Chip Black. Um, and that is a text that is um, about Prince George's County, Maryland. And she calls it the construction of public identities. Um, other people have talked about this too, like Joe Fagan down in Texas. Uh, but essentially people um, create these public identities in order to be treated um, fairly. Um, one of my colleagues at Berkeley has also written about this in healthcare encounters. Um, Tina Sachs has talked about um, the, the, the work and efforts that women prepare themselves to do when they're getting ready to encounter um, healthcare professionals. So again, changes in, in hair, dress, diction, all in an effort to communicate to people. And you could argue to assimilate in, in some ways um, so that people can treat them, with, so they can expect to be treated with respect. That, that's a really important component and, and the, like you mentioned, vigilance and, and how people navigate those different worlds and the, the, the stress that that could create. I think it's, it's a really telling component in, in, uh, in, the, Latin America, in the Latino uh, literature, we have similar paradoxical components, and that's one of the issues that people have studied. Uh, so lots of the intersections of these different worlds, as well as different identities, and how people navigate those are, are, are really critical. Uh, someone mentioned, there's a couple of questions here of the books that you, you mentioned. We will be sharing the slides uh, mm -hmm. for everyone. We will be emailing to everyone who registered, so mm -hmm. you'll have them there. Uh, we have another question from Donna. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how incarceration impacts seeking mental health support? Yeah, that was um, something that I should have anticipated out of the, the depression quality and experience um, study that I did, but I did not anticipate that. So I didn't ask a lot of questions about incarceration, but the study sample that I collected, so these were African-American men who were largely poor and working class. Um, many of them had um, experience incarceration. Um, so they kind of had these firsthand experiences of sentencing disparities. Um, they also recognized the role of structural racism. Um, but in that, they did talk about um, sort of mental health. Um, many of them talked about, you know, dealing with substance use disorders as well how that sort of fueled their likelihood to end up being incarcerated, um, how they weren't really treated um, within those settings and, and how difficult it was to, to come back to their communities of origin um, with uh, either being on parole or, or being on probation. So that created another sort of, for me, it was unanticipated um, but for them, it, it fit all together because they were under supervision. They were really worried about uh, making mistakes, um, trying to avoid certain vices. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly in there and that's a really great question. I know I don't have a great answer for that, but spot on, yeah. And I, had a, I, had a, I had a question that you mentioned before in your experience with the focus group with the men how that for them was very therapeutic and that they, they, they it felt like if I understood you correctly, that they were actually wanting a space like that. So have you thought about modality treatment, modalities of support uh, that take that, that take advantage of, of, of that need and spaces for that for uh, for black men in particular? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I so full disclosure, I'm not a clinician like you, Leo. So that's something where I need some some transdisciplinary um, collaboration to think about how to design it. I think it it absolutely is something that um, 
should be done. Um, and I think if we can do some some work to figure out what the acceptability of it and what the most appropriate um, way to deliver um, care through a, a sort of support group modality, I think that would be really awesome. Very cool. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think there, there's a lot of spaces for that mm -hmm. and, and opportunities for different treatment modalities that that, that, that actually take a strength and, and mm -hmm. of, of the community and that men want to get together to talk about the things. I think it's really a powerful tool for that and, and yeah. some support group for that. And we have a great question from Angela, and, and actually this is something that also was raised by others. Uh, she talks about a, a young man, a young black man in, in Georgia was just followed while jogging and shot to death by two mm -hmm. white men claiming he was going to rob someone. So not being able to jog or walk down the street is very real, as you mentioned in, yeah. the, in some of your side. How does, uh, her question is, how does hearing stories like this worsen the mental health, uh, the mental health uh, for young children? Uh, and, and I will say for, for our communities of color, uh, uh, the, the, this news and these incidents, how, how have been your experience of how it impacts the health and well, the mental health and well-being of, of, of our communities. Yeah, yeah. Thanks to Angela for bringing that up, and, and that is something that came across my radar. And there's so many of these stories; it becomes disheartening that um, you know the cases in in, in Prince George's County. Um, thinking about my hometown, Detroit, which is disproportionately been impacted by the virus. In addition, in addition to that case in Georgia. Um, again, it, it cooperates well with what, what research has shown, which is that um, people do feel some apprehension, at least, um, when interacting in, in, in certain spaces, including getting physical activity. Um, that does have community level implications. Um, everything from sort of like a community level kind of um, stress every time there's a, a police involved shooting or um, some well known kind of community event, whether it's Ferguson or Baltimore or many Minnesota or New Orleans, Baton Rouge, whatever the case may be. Um, people frequent those areas. They see the areas that once the media is gone, people live there, there's kids who grow up there. So I think that um, a lot of the weight falls onto parents to kind of educate and make meaning of what they're what they're seeing. Unfortunately, um, I think there needs to be uh, also the consideration of not just mental health, but also physical health. So I just reviewed a paper this week um, that should be coming out relatively soon that talked about um, essentially community level or neighborhood level. Um, effects on physical health outcomes as related to being, um, you know, sort of a host to um, a police involved shooting. So, yeah, there's a lot of implications there. Um, again, I don't have a great answer there, but I think it does have um, certainly family level. Another another one of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, Rihanna Anderson, also does work. Um, she's a clinical psychologist, and so she does work around thinking about how to um, help families to make meaning of and promote resilience, even when people have been exposed to tragic news like the case in, in Georgia. So yeah, that's that's all I can say right now without having a great answer there. No, 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 excellent, excellent answer. And the importance of resilience for, the, for communities are, are it's critical, how to, how to build that resilience. So we're up to five o'clock right now, it's the end of the hour. Uh, I wanna thank Dr. Hudson for a great presentation for everyone who joined us online uh, to the, for this seminar. Our next seminar will be uh, May 20th at 4 p.m. We will send out a, an invitation and information about the, uh, that seminar. Uh, and we hope that everyone enjoy uh, this component. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. And we'll see mm -hmm. each other uh, soon. And take care, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.